The title of today's message is Expecting More from God. I wanted to begin and explain why I talk so many Sundays about what's going on culturally, especially in America. And it's not just America, if you're watching, it's the whole world is groaning in birth pains because there are all kinds of competing worldviews or false messianic movements that are promising healing and deliverance and salvation and utopia to the world. But that's all because of the vacuum that's created by the church. Because there's only one savior from the sin. And sin is the problem that is corrupting the earth. And only Jesus Christ saves from sin. But God is looking to raise up a church that believes his word. That walks in the power of the Holy Spirit. That has come mature in Jesus Christ. That has restored, if I may say it, the apostolic faith. It is simply put, Jesus is Lord. And wherever Christ is proclaimed, people turn from the darkness to the light. From the power of the devil to the power of God. The world is looking for that grace of God in our lives to show at every level of our lives, from our individual life to how we operate in our families, to our church, to our businesses, to our cities, and to our nations. They want to see how this leaven of the kingdom is good. Because God wants to bless even the unbeliever, as, as hard as it may be for some Christians to hear this. God wants them to get a vision of what it looks like to experience his divine heavenly rule on earth. Some people, you can just paint the picture and say, here's what God's word says. And they say, I see it. I see it. I'm bought in. I'm sold out. But some people, they actually need to experience it personally. And then they dare to believe that God is good and that I can surrender my life to him and follow him. And so we want to create that kind of life in, all, in everything that we do, from our families to our businesses, to our school, to our church, to our communities, to our nations. That God is good and that he loves people and he's inviting all men everywhere to come back to him. To come out of the bondage and oppression of a world bound in sin and come and taste and see that the Lord is good. And there's nobody who has ever received Jesus Christ and been filled with the Holy Spirit who ever said, yeah, I was sold a false bill of goods. No, they, they become full of life and say, Lord, you truly are the Savior of the world. And that is beautiful. I also want to talk about these things because it was Pastor David, at, we were talking last weekend and he was saying to me that America is at a critical crossroads as a nation. We have never been here before where we will either continue with the foundation and the inheritance that was left to us by our forefathers or we will accept another God and another God will create a culture of bondage and oppression. And the way I see it is that there really are two roads that are set before us. One is the road that will come because Christians don't dare to believe and restore apostolic power and purity in the church. That will lead to a culture where we worship another God and we experience persecution that comes under tyranny and oppression. We would like to avoid that at all costs, and it's possible to avoid that because the gospel is that powerful. And yet I talk about this week after week because there are so many who don't believe that that's a possibility. They really don't. They've already settled that it's inevitable that we are headed towards a culture of bondage and oppression. And that's why we wrestle with the, the word of God week after week about these things. Because we need to really wrestle with scripture. Because whatever scripture teaches, that is the truth. Right? But the other road for us, if we are honest as a culture is also a road of persecution for Christians, but a different kind. Well, what do I mean by that? Our culture, you could explain it like an analogy. America is like a heroin addict. We've already got addicted to heroin, and there's going to be some radical withdrawal systems, withdrawal when we try to put it back in order. It's like we have to love a culture back into health and be gracious and patient with all that that will cause. 
because there are misunderstandings and there is some reality to the false church or false religion has helped create the mess that we are in. See, the battle within Christianity has always been between the true church and the false church. The church that is faithful to God's word and is alive in the Holy Spirit and manifests the love of God and keeps in the lane that God has ordained in scripture for it. And the church that says, wow, worldly power and wealth and importance. Basically, the church adopts the systems of this world. And, we have, and then we end up with the problems that we're facing today. In many sense, we can say, God, we're guilty. We're responsible. We did it. Forgive us, Lord. Lord, help us. Lord, we know that you can save us. Every human being who has gotten their lives into great bondage but turned to the Lord, they confess, Jesus set me free. He set me free and he is powerful to save. Every mar marriages that have come under great um, conflict where it was almost at the brink of death, but then Jesus came. And it was resurrected and restored and turned from death to life. And they, they confess, we didn't save ourselves, Jesus saved us. And the same thing can happen in a nation, and that's harder for people to believe. But these are some of the reasons why we talk about these things week after week. And I have a deep conviction that there is power in the gospel of Jesus Christ to heal nations. And that is something promised throughout scriptures, Old and New Testament. That it is Jesus who heals individuals and nations through the gospel because the root of the problem is sin. You know, I really have been thinking a lot about what I see. And I praise God that a lot of people, even unbelievers, they are agreeing with the way God designed things and the way God created things. And they're, they're seeing something really beautiful about the foundation of America, especially that, you know, that they're able to sell all kinds of packages. Learn about America's history. Learn about the Constitution. Learn about justice. We've got to fight critical race theory. And all the different things that they are really able to market and sell today because there's a giant market for it. But I can actually go back decade by decade by decade and, and can show you that there have been faithful voices that have been holding the line on truth that is common to all through common grace. And yet we've been losing the light. Best way to say it, we've been losing the soul because the heart of liberty is in Jesus Christ. It's not in a constitution. It's not in just laws. You can have all the best laws in the world, but if sin is reigning in our hearts, then everything will continue to fall apart. And so the challenge is that the ax has to be put to the root of the problem, and we have to resurrect the forms and the message of Christianity that historically have harvested pagan, barbarian nations that have turned around Christian nations that had fallen into great apostasy. I mean, it's a little known fact that uh, in, in the medieval ages, slavery was almost completely wiped out except for the fringes of the empire through the gospel of Jesus Christ. It only came back because of apostasy, because of the church that became worldly. I mean, we saw this right even in, if you go back to Eusebius, he talks about really a different perspective on everything. The church, as it started to get out of persecution, started to get worldly. And then he writes, and God in his mercy sent another persecution to purify the church. Isn't that an interesting perspective? So this has been the battle from the beginning to maintain the purity of the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit so that we are faithful sons and daughters of God. I mean, that's what it is. We need to love like Christ loved, forgive like Christ forgave. We need to be full of life and peace and joy and hope. And so like, yeah, if I really wanted to hammer sin, let's hammer people for their sins. Because a lot of times we have all kinds of different paradigms. Like if I don't feel like I've been shredded in church, then I haven't really been to church. Well, really, it's if you haven't heard the living word of God, you haven't been to church. If God is saying strengthen the weak and we're shredding the weak, then we're not faithful to God. But if we're living in compromise and we're not confronting it, then we're not faithful to God. Do you see the difference? And in so one sense, you could say hopelessness, discouragement, frustration, uh, 
scoffing and doubting and unbelieving. These are the grossest sins that are robbing the world of the life of the Spirit of God flowing through the church. I don't know how to wrap my head around that, but it changes the whole paradigm, doesn't it? You know, it's not just about how have I broken all these sins. I mean, if you were to go to many churches and you're asked, well, probably what is the greatest sin in the church? Because, you know, most Christian churches will most mostly faithful, we'll put it that way, most mostly faithful Christian churches will not say that homosexuality is a valid lifestyle for a believer. It doesn't mean that we don't love homosexuals. They're human beings created in the image of God. Jesus died for them. And your sexuality is only one part of your whole life and existence. And basically speaking, if God loves them and we are not loving them, not, you don't love by accepting the behavior. You love them by loving them and telling them the truth and walking with them and nurturing them to health. So I'm not talking about that. So if you were to talk to the most, mostly faithful churches, they, you would say, what is the grossest sin that you could get caught and entangled in, in, in as Christians? And you, they would probably say pornography. And I was talking with somebody last week, in the middle of the week, ran into somebody. He was telling me the statistics of Christians that are uh, addicted to pornography. And I said, and I just out of my mouth, I go, that's rubbish. You don't believe those statistics are true? No, I believe the statistics are true, but it's rubbish because there is complete power in the gospel of Jesus Christ to set them free. And it's not a hard deliverance. It, it really is when the spirit of God is moving and we're really fixing our eyes on Jesus and growing in his word and we have security and trust in him and we're running to him rather than from him. It's funny how all the bondages are broken and we're free. But it all, it all begins... I'll begin my message soon, don't worry. It all begins, it all begins when we actually are secure and confident and obnoxiously bold in the simple truth that Christ has died for us. I mean, that's it. Christ has died for us. What, you know, what is your, um, oh, okay, never mind. I'm going to share a story that I probably shouldn't share, Stephanie. But many, many, many years ago, uh, this is a warning, so plug your ears. You might want to walk out the back. So, all right. um, years and years ago, I, it was like a Sunday morning, and, we, and you know, I had to go and preach, and we had a good fight before the Sunday service. And she says to me, how are you going to go preach now after this? And I said, watch me. We do it because the blood of Jesus Christ, not because we are worthy, because he is worthy to be proclaimed. And there's something about resting in the finished work of Jesus Christ upon the cross that, get, that starts to break you out of your sins and your failures, but it gives you the boldness. But it ultimately really is about that. There are people that need to know Jesus. There are people, if Paul can rejoice that people preach Christ for selfish ambition, then we know that it's the Christ being proclaimed has the power to save lives. Isn't that awesome? So, but just having people strengthened in that boldness that Jesus died for me and that is the confidence that I'm standing in. It's not a Jesus died for me and my sins are forgiven so I can go sin however I want and, and thank God that I'm forgiven. No, it's so that I can get back on track and live in his presence and not go stand in the corner and say, I'm a horrible, crummy Christian. I'm a wretched Christian. And part of what we're doing, and, and a lot of people don't understand it, but it's we're trying to develop strength in the body of Christ. When I talk about, hey, if you really realize the good news that I preached earlier was that persecution is coming for better or for worse. And you're like, well, that's not really a fun message on a Sunday morning, is it? You just told me a rock and a hard place. No, we have Jesus Christ. We're not afraid, but we need to make people strong to endure in the day of testing. I don't care who you are, and I don't care what's going on in society and culture. All who seek to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Every human being, your life will go through fires and trials and testings. And sometimes they will be so hard that you won't even believe that you can get through them. But when you surrender all to Jesus Christ, he'll walk you right out of them and bring forth beauty for ashes. Amen. Because that is the Jesus whom we serve. And so we are not afraid of anything that the future has to offer. We are not afraid in the day of trial and testing and tribulation because we know him whom we believe. 
but we need to make people strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So to experience authentic Christianity, I'm just going to say these things fast and finally get in the message, because I want to put these ideas in our head. There is power in the gospel, and that needs to be restored to the church. And the presence of God needs to be restored to the church in our individual daily lives and in our corporate gatherings and meetings. Because it's the presence of God that makes all the difference and the power of the Holy Spirit. We can believe all the truths of Scripture, but we need to be filled with power from on high. And we need the manifest presence of God. And I'm sharing these things because we need to start seeking God for them. And expecting God for him. And don't think that God won't answer. So last week, you know, so really that is the image that had been holding out. Is that we can restore apostolic Christianity in our generation. That opportunity is before us as it's before every generation. The promises of God are sure. But we kind of likened it last week to the Israelites who were delivered out of Egypt and told, I'm going to give you the promised land. And when they got there, he said, hey, go take it. And he said, I thought you're giving it to us. No, go take it. That is how I'm giving it to you. Go and take it. And it didn't mix that word with faith. It said that was the gospel preached to them. The kingdom is yours. Go and take it. Right? Yes. But, I, but it takes people who are courageous who trust in the word of God, who don't trust what their eyes see. We're grasshoppers in the midst of giants. And so many believers today are magnifying the power of sin, the power even of the bondage of pornography or whatever, or magnifying the power of the totalitarian state. And whenever we're magnifying anything other than the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are cutting off that power from being manifested. So that's really what this season and series of messages is, ab is about, is seeking to restore that bold expectation and hope that God will do what he said he will do, grounded in the word of God, grounded in the promises of God. Every time that I have seen God moving in a community like wildfire, it, there, it was kind of like simple walking on water. We just believe God. We were hungry for God. We, we expected God. And then we started to get excited because we, we always were going to wondering, what is God going to do today? What is God going to do when we gather today? And we want to revive that expectation in the hearts of this church because seek, ask, seek, and knock, you'll have what you seek for, what, you, what you're looking for. But if we're not aimed to seek the greatest things, then we're going to miss the things that matter most. And when Jesus said that, the thing that was the most important was the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. So Lord, fill this church, fill every member, fill every child with the Holy Spirit. Lord, at Fortis Academy that's about to start, fill every student with the Holy Spirit. Because without the Holy Spirit, we are nothing more than, in a sense, old covenant believers. It's the Holy Spirit that gives us power from on high to walk free, to live free, and to be truly alive. But we should be seeking it. We should be asking the Lord daily, Lord, we need your Holy Spirit. You know, we get into all these theological debates, like, well, you got to believe that when you receive the whole Holy Spirit, well, fine, I don't care whether I receive the same Holy Spirit that Jesus had. It's not manifesting on him like it is on me, right? Or it manifested a lot better on him than on me. Well, that's Jesus, so we can't compare ourselves to Jesus, even though Scripture says that we're bent to be conformed to the image of Christ and he came to reproduce sons, but we won't go down that road today. So fine, Jesus is too awesome and glorious, which I don't believe with theologically, but Jesus is too awesome and glorious to uh, compare ourselves to, so fine. The Apostle Paul had a whole lot more of the manifestation of the Holy Ghost than I did. And I don't say that to feel condemned. I say it to get excited that these things are written so that we can seek those things. Lord, whatever it takes, whatever the cost, help me to pay it. Lord, I want to hunger. I want to seek. But I have been convinced by personal experience that there is no mighty hero individual with God. What there is is the community of faith. And many of the people who have gotten to be used by the anointing of the Holy Spirit in the most profound ways, it had to do with the community, had unity of faith and expectations and value that really God has made it such 
that the unity of the church is often what drives the power and glory. And whoever kind of gets to be up the front often gets the credit, which they really need to be down on their face saying, no, Jesus gets the glory. But it's like, it would be like a superstar in a football team, right? If that superstar always took all the glory, then all the other people that made him able to do the things that he did, we're going to say, we're done. We're going to let people sack you. We're not going to defend you anymore. And next thing you know, he's not a great superstar anymore. So the, the ones who are intelligent and actually understand the way things are, they'll say, no, this wasn't me. This was them. I just got the benefit of their block and, and what they are doing because it's a team and the church is a team and it's a body. All right. Now the message. Jesus is the Messiah, the savior and hope of the world. So the hope is a revelation of King Jesus. In John 4, 22 through 26, the woman at the well, I'm just going to take a little section from this. He says, he says to the woman at the well, you worship what you do not know. That's a hard word, isn't it? It's not very loving, Jesus. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. That word right there is huge. I'll get back to it. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. Wait, you're a Samaritan. She had a depth of insight that many of the Jews didn't have. She was eagerly expecting Messiah will come who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. But that word, salvation is of the Jews, is a message that the promise to Abraham in you, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. All of the nations of the earth are groaning under the bondage of tyranny and oppression and sin and idolatry. And they're groaning to be set free to, to experience life as God designed and created them for. But there's no salvation anywhere else. Where is salvation? Salvation is of the Jews. Because that old covenant gave birth to Messiah. Isn't that awesome? The salvation, so the implication there is the salvation of the world, not just the salvation of the Jews. Salvation is of the Jews. Isn't that awesome? And so all of the promises of Scripture of what will Messiah's rule and reign bring all becomes a present possibility the moment you dare to believe that Jesus Christ is Lord when you believe that he is Messiah and that he has already sat down on the throne and he has begun his reign and that his reign is executed through the power of the Holy Spirit poured out on the earth. Everything on the day of Pentecost were signs that are connected to Old Testament scriptures that Messiah has sat on the throne. And it is through the Holy Spirit as we heard at communion, his law is written on us, our hearts and we are caused to walk in his ways then you will know me. I will be your God and you will be my people. This salvation is of the Jews, has been opened up to all the world. Today I said it's expecting more from God. Notice that this woman expected something when Messiah comes. And then he surprises her. I am he. I am here. I am present. And almost like a lot of times theologians always wrestle with, well, look at all the miracles that happened in Jesus and Jesus didn't die and Jesus didn't resurrect. How do you, how do you, re how do you reconcile all of these different things? He's Messiah. He has come in the flesh, right? Look at David's mighty works before he sat down on, as king. Do you see what I'm saying? Another way to say it is the sun is beginning to rise and the earth is beginning to see light. And these are the signs that the kingdom is coming because Jesus is going to reconcile all creation to the Father through the blood of the cross. And then worshiping in spirit and in truth. 
so many churches. I like, said, so if we really want to restore apostolic Christianity, we need to get that, those two prongs in our soul. We need to worship him in truth. You have good sound doctrine. See, a lot of these churches, they focus so much on the truth, but not the spirit. And there's no power. And then you have all these other ones that are all about the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit, and they don't have enough truth, and they do things that are really stupid. I'll just be honest. They do really foolish things. We need, when the two come together, worshiping the Lord in spirit and in truth, now we are restoring apostolic Christianity. So my next point is blind men who see in a world of seeing men who are blind. So I'm just reading a bunch of stories and scriptures, and hopefully as I'm reading these things, your expectation is going to grow. So in Matthew 9, 27 through 30, when Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying out, saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him, and they said to him, or Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? Do you believe that I can give you sight? Because that question was critical to the manifestation of the kingdom of God. And that's the same question that we need to wrestle with today. Do you believe I am able to do this? And so many people don't believe that God can forgive me or God can love me or God likes me or that he can set me free from these things that always make me feel horrible about myself. Do you believe he can do this? Because he can, if you will only believe. And they said to him, yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes and he said, according to your faith, be it unto you. And their eyes were opened. You see, when I say that we need to expect more from God, a lot of times we expect the opposite of what we should expect by faith. And it be it done unto us according to our faith. I expect failure. I expect um, God is angry at me. I expect to be not loved in the church. I have all kinds of expectations and give all kinds of impossible. God can't save America. God can't move and bring revival here. And I said, what stronghold is there that Christ cannot overcome? What darkness can he not break with his light? What chain is he is so strong that Jesus Christ and the blood that he shed can't break it? Be it done according to your faith. So people without expectation are robbed of the gift that God wants to give them. Without expectation, we are robbed. So we see that when Jesus came to his own country, he began to teach in their synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this with he, which is given to him that such mighty works are performed by his hands? So like this was the, this was the beginning of the seed of faith arising in them. The fire is beginning to light. Because those are the what right questions. Who is this man? What is this wisdom? What are these mighty works that he did? That faith is starting to ignite, but then they snuffed it out. See what I'm saying here? Because the beginning of that language was the language of faith starting to be ignited. And the devil says, uh-oh, snuff it out. And, they, and so now it gets snuffed out. And they said... Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him. The fire of faith was snuffed out. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. And that could be a really challenging word for the church of Jesus Christ today. When the fire of faith is trying to be ignited, do we snuff it out because we are offended or we don't expect enough? Or our theological programming snuffs it out automatically or our life's experiences have snuffed it out automatically or we already know what God does. We've seen the best and now we're on autopilot and we, ne we don't dare to expect more, Right? And this is really interesting because what was said here really just 
I don't even know how to take this because it's humorous and heartbreaking at the same time. Now, he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Jesus marveled at their unbelief. I have so much to give you, and you snuffed out the faith that would have given it to you. But what is really interesting to me here is he could do no mighty works there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And I said, man, if that happened in any church across America today, we would say we had a revival. <laughs> do you realize? I mean, it's heartbreaking and tragic, but there's just this assumption of this is normal Christianity. And there, they, he marveled at their unbelief because all he could do was let, heal a few people when you laid hands on them. We would say, we, we saw a few people healed, hallelujah, we've got revival. God is in our midst. And Jesus walked away from that situation marveling at their unbelief. That gives us some perspective, doesn't it? Of how far, far we have fallen from the faith once and for all delivered unto the saints. Like going back to that foundation, then we, oh, we feel so guilty. No, we should feel excited that there is more. So Lord, teach us how to ignite that fire of faith so that you won't have to marvel at our unbelief, but you will marvel at our faith. And all these and greater works you shall do because I go to my Father. So there we were, there we were just looking at two encounters where two blind men in a world of blind people, in a sense, because they didn't see what was possible in Messiah, because they expected from God received healing. And here in his own hometown, because of their lack of expectation, they didn't. But that's just very, very much individualized, right? But what about national level stuff? In, in deliverance from national destruction comes from God. How big is our faith? We need the faith of Mordecai. I mean, that really is the challenge that I would say today. I've always loved the book of Esther. And I, I read it, and often I will just weep. And if I ever need to get on fire, well, that's actually one of many passages in Scripture that can light me on fire every time I read it. But I always get I always intrigued because they wrote the rest of Esther because people are offended that it didn't name the name of God in the book of Esther. And I'm like, if you read the book of Esther with eyes that are open, you're like, God is just screaming out, leaping off the pages of Esther in a way you didn't need to say his name because his glory is being manifested, right? And, and so, like, so just to give us perspective in America with the things that we are facing, the Jews were facing a decree that was published irrevocably by law that all Jews were to be massacred. All Jews in the empire were to be utterly destroyed and all their possessions were to be looted. To inspire you to execute this decree, you can take whatever you can get from the people that you kill. It's a bloodbath. And the, date was, the day was already appointed from the very highest levels of the nation. But subtly behind the scenes, unbeknownst to Haman, the murderer, that God had been putting things in place. And I dare to believe that the God that we serve has done the same thing today. But it also, I remember I said there's two roads before America. Will Esther listen to the voice of Mordecai and obey? Or will she listen to the voice of fear and human wisdom and withdraw? So Mordecai and a bunch of others, they clothed themselves in sackcloth and went to mourning. And Esther went and said, hey, what's going on here? Right? And they kind of have this dialogue back and forth. And Mordecai says, you need to go into the king. And take care of this. And Esther's like, no. If I go into the king, it's decreed by law that I will be put to death. If he didn't invite me and I go into the king, I will die. Unless he puts the scepter out towards me. So think about this. She had to conquer her fears. She had to conquer her insecurities. She had to take up the cross and follow Jesus in essence. And say, I am not going to try to preserve my life. 
and watch my people perish. I, I, I might as well take the risk. I have no guarantee of success. But Mordecai had a word of faith because he knew the truths of Scripture and the promises of God and the eternal covenants of God. And Mordecai told them to answer Esther, do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. You're operating on a false principle. Once this bloodbath happens, you're going down too. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. In other words, God's promises and covenant will not fail. I don't know how, but God will make good his word. Everything that he has prophesied, everything he has promised will come to pass. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And we know the rest of that story. And it plays out with the sovereignty of God so beautifully. And one of my favorite scenes in that whole picture is when, when Haman thinks that he's going to be honored. And next thing you know, he's honoring Mordecai. And he goes home all dejected. He has to pass the gallows that he built to hang Mordecai on. And he tells his wife. And, she, and then his wife had like this sudden epiphany. Is this Mordecai a Jew? Yeah, why? Oh, no. You will not prevail against him, but he will prevail against you. When I said the presence of God with the people of God is our inheritance, the people knew that God is present with his people, and that he's the God who delivered them out of Egypt, and he's the God of miracles, and he's the God that saves. And, and he only put them into captivity because of their rebellion against him. But know that, he, like they said, is Aslan a tame lion? No, he's dangerous. He's mighty. He is God Almighty. And if he makes a choice to, to stand up for his people in a moment, he will turn the tide in a second. But Esther, just like those Israelites outside the promised land, had to go face her fears and act in faith, not counting her life in the danger to her life, something to be measured, but to hear and obey. It's beautiful, isn't it? This isn't the kind of Christianity. These are heroes of faith. These are not babes. These are mature soldiers like we heard last week. A fountain of champions coming forth from the blood of Christ. The life is in the blood. These are the heroes that when you read their stories, you say, I see something truly beautiful. And if you really look closely, the cross seems to always be right in the center. Why? They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Yeah, my God will, can deliver me from the burning fiery furnace, but I don't know that he will. But nevertheless, I will not bow down and worship another God. The cross is at the heart of all of the heroes of faith. The confident expectation of the victorious church. I mean, I'm really trying to get this grounded in Scripture. Matthew 16, 15 through 18, Jesus took him up to Caesarea Philippi, surrounded by all these idols. And in the midst of all these other gods, he said, who do you say that I am? And, and through a series of things, because they, they told Jesus what other people said, but he said, but who do, you, who do you say that I am? Because that is the question every human being needs to answer for themselves. And Simon Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. You have just received the greatest treasure that can be given in this life. To be able to answer that question, who are you? Who is Jesus? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And he says, that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail. And we see in here, one, that the church is instituted by Jesus Christ. And all of the anti-church, I am a Christian, but I don't believe in church, that is so false. And it's robbing the world of, of salvation, of light, and of glory, and of hope. But the good news is 
ultimately it's Jesus is building his church. We don't build his church. He builds it, yet he works through us because we are his body. But we have to have bold, radical confidence that Jesus is building his church. And if Jesus is building his church, his church will be built. Jesus will not fail to build his church. I mean, these are the truths that when we secure ourselves in them, he's looking for a generation that will dare to believe that what God said he will do. There is a generation that will see Jesus build his church of which the gates of hell will not prevail. In other words, the, the gates of hell don't, does not come against the church. The church is the worldwide liberation army that delivers the world from bondage. I will build my church and they will go out and liberate the world and the gates of hell will not stand. The walls of Jericho will fall down. There is a generation that is going to dare to believe God's word and they're going to do this. In, in, in every generation, the Spirit of the Lord is looking to and fro on the earth. Can I find somebody who will dare to believe? Can I dare to find a people who will let this fire be lit in their midst and not let it be snuffed out? Can I find a people that will just be set on fire with this truth and become that church that liberates the world? I promise you the gates of hell will not prevail. All authority in heaven and earth is mine. Go. And make disciples. You see, and you can think already in your own soul. All, all the things that want to come in and say it's impossible. It can't be done. You know, or I'm too busy building my own house. Or all, I'm, too, I'm too hurt. I'm too broken. I'm not good enough. When I keep asking the Lord, how do we build a church that's structured to bring people to maturity? I'll get into that next. Because I, I was getting ahead of myself. The epicenter of the worldwide liber liberation movement is deliverance from sin through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why will the gates of hell not prevail? Because we're going to go in and we're going to get to the people and we're going to bring them to Jesus Christ and he's going to set them free from their sin and he's going to put his spirit in them and he's going to transform them from the inside out. So this was funny. I want to talk about our conversation with Pastor David on this one, but... Romans 7, 23 through 24, because the title of the message is still expecting more from God. So Romans 7, 23 through 24. But I see another law in my members warring against the law in my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Summarizing this is Paul's basically saying, I was alive once and the law came, sin revived and I died. What did you mean? I thought I was a pretty good person. I thought I was loving. I thought I was God's gift to the whole world. But then I started to see reality. What? Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not covet or lust as the last commandment. And all Jesus did, he, all he did was apply the law faithfully. He didn't change the law. He just properly taught the laws it was originally given. The last commandment took all the other things before and said, Thou shalt not lust or covet is that word. In other words, it's applied to the things of the heart. Otherwise, it wouldn't, it wouldn't just be love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It would just be love the Lord with external obedience to the law. Do you see what I'm saying? So the law comes and shows us that we're not as good as we thought we were. But it doesn't just come, because people picture it like this. It's you are evil, you are wretched, you are corrupt. But something wrestles in us and says, well, that's not true either. We, you know, we are not worthy, but we're not worthless. Do you hear what I'm saying? We are not worthy, but we are not worthless either. We are created in the image of God. And there's much of that image that is still to be celebrated and rejoiced over, even in the sinners that are in the most bondage. Because God loves them too and sees something that has worth. And we know that it has worth because he purchased it with his blood. He, he believed that their worth was worth the death of his own son. That's pretty wild, isn't it? And we need, really need to own those truths in the depth of our soul. 
But Paul was basically making this statement that in the members or in this body or in this death-doomed physical body, there is a law of sin that wants to live for the flesh, that lives for the animal things. You know, even the ancient Greeks kind of figured this out. There's the rational and there's the carnal, right? Because they, people can understand this stuff, even the law is written on their hearts, even without the law given at Sinai, right? Because we see, we use the thing between our ears and we realize everything falls apart if we cheat on each other and we lie to one another and we can't trust one another and we murder and steal from one another, right? We realize that's not the kind of world that I want to live in. So I begin to agree with the law in my mind, but I keep finding myself doing the things that I do not want to do. And the whole old covenant was, I've made atonement for you so that I, my presence can be with you. You are forgiven. The heart of the old, old Testament was the atonement, the forgiveness of sins. It was God being with his people because he had made a sacrifice. But really it was looking to the sacrifice of Jesus because the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. Right? But the whole Old Testament was all about mercy and grace. The whole idea of the angry, mean, nasty, evil Old Testament God is just a myth. The heart of all, the Bible from cover to cover paints one God, one church. All it was was pre-Messiah and post-Messiah. being recorded. Oh, so we're back. We came back from technical difficulties. But so what I'm saying is that this law of sin and death, it's a law of sin and death in the flesh that causes me to do the things that I don't want to do. And Paul says, who will deliver me from this body of death? And I did a lot of research into the Greek myself personally. So this is my personal translation. And it flows with the logic and it flows with the reason. But you can totally reject it because it can be proven from later in Romans 8. But I would say it was, I praise God through the Lord Jesus Christ that he, it was implied that he has done this very thing. But see, there they leave it, you can, because they're the extra piece of, so, so with the mind I serve the law of God, but with my body I serve sin. They, they leave, I praise God, and then he, that there's a summary there. And so it's a really hard thing to figure out the logic of the translation. Does that make sense? Because there's also a summary in there. But the point is, later in Romans 8, it says, 8-2, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So that law of sin and death that, may, that is operating in me so that I find myself doing the things that I do not want to do. It says there's a law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that sets me free from that law. Right? And you see, God didn't condemn all the Old Testament saints, Old Covenant, that rejoiced and they were forgiven. But most of the modern church just rejoices that we're forgiven and that's all they stay. That's where they stay. And that's okay. But I say this is all about expectation. They don't expect the law of the spirit of life to set them free from the law of sin and death, be it done according to your faith. But if you hear what it says here, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus will set you free from the law of sin and death, be it done according to your faith. That's the faith we want people to encounter and experience. But there is no condemnation because what happens is what people will often feel condemned and feel worthless and not worthy and don't dare to believe that they deserve this good merciful, gracious blessing from God. And yet it was the Father's heart to give you the kingdom. So when we just settle, like that's why I said the one Sunday, just settle the fact we suck. Our flesh is horrible. It's wretched. It is our enemy. It's one of the three enemies, right? Get over yourself. 
It's never been about you. It's always been about, it's been about Jesus and what he's done for you. Dare to believe and you will see. So we need to increase our expectation. Ooh, I'm done. Uh. There was the batteries. I'm going to wrap this up. Let me think. Last week we heard of champions springing forth from communion, and that's what God wants to do. But it comes when we dare to believe the truths of Scripture. Right? We need to dare to expect more from God. We have to dare to expect the power of the Holy Spirit. We have to dare to expect that God will answer our prayers. But we're really looking to get a church to light that fire that we were talking about. Like we saw when Jesus in his own hometown, that fire was starting to light and they snuffed it out. But we want to light that fire in one another, encourage one another, be unified, praying, God, manifest your power through your Holy Spirit in all your people throughout the world. Because we don't want it in our church only. We want it in the whole church throughout the world. But there is one thing that I will do want to point out that was in my notes in the whole section. Because one of the passions that we have is to bring forth maturity. And, and God wants all his people to be mature. And yet so many times we expect immaturity. We expect irresponsibility from one another. We, we create people dependent on the man of God or the woman of God. And do you ever ask, well, do you expect that that man or woman of God is always crying about their troubles and trying to need to not stand and I need help all the time? No. We need to reproduce champions expecting that there is no Christian in the kingdom of God that is better than any other Christian in a sense. We are all the projects of his mercy and grace. We are all brothers and sisters in Christ with the potential to grow up in Christ. And when we dare to believe and expect his grace is sufficient and his power is able to heal, to deliver, to set free, to bring life. When we dare to believe that he can heal us of every wound, that he can heal us of our bitterness, he can heal us of the things that are self-destructive in our personal relationships, in our lives. When we dare to believe, then Jesus won't marvel at our unbelief and say, all I could do is heal a few people when I laid hands on them. It painted a picture of an incredible world of healing and deliverance and hope and joy and peace for individuals and nations. That is the inheritance of the apostolic gospel that Jesus wants to restore today. And we are being presented with the opportunity to dare to believe and enter in or not mix the gospel with faith. And let it wait. Those promises will come. But it will come in another generation that dares to believe. So the Spirit of God is looking on the earth. Will we dare to humble ourselves and believe God? Take him at his word and light that fire of the faith that was once and for all delivered unto the saints. In Jesus' name. Amen, Lord. Amen, Lord. Let's stand together. Hallelujah. Hmm. Lord, we thank you that you are indeed calling out a people for yourselves. For your, for, yes, for yourselves. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It's, you are at work in us in every way, shape, and form that you can muster, Lord, in us. If we will dare to believe you, thank you for that. Lord, we, we will dare to say yes to you because you are at work and you will fulfill that which you have started. You will complete it, Lord. Thank you for that. Lord, you are reviving and resurrecting 
minds that are that have been doubting and 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 fearful you are reviving and resurrecting lord uh guilt and shame and and all kinds of things that have been hindrances lord but you are calling us up out of dead places and into places lord that are going to be alive in you that you are igniting something new and fresh in us we believe the word that says you are doing a new thing and that you want us to forget the old stuff Lord, and you want to call us in, you are calling us into a people that dare to believe you just the same as Esther, just the same as Daniel, just the same as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Lord. We thank you for that. Lord, I pray that you will open our eyes, that we will see exactly for ourselves, individually, first of all. As we stand here before you, you are calling us by name. Lord, and you are saying, this is what I want to do inside of you. This is what I want you to see. This is what I want you to begin to imagine. Things greater than you have seen. And don't worry about where you are circumstantially because it may not make any sense to you at the moment, but that's okay. I see where you are and you're there for a reason. Let it have its perfect work. Embrace the process. You have no idea what is being set before you. Be patient and let patience and perseverance have its perfect work. We thank you, Lord, for that covenant that you have made with us. We thank you, Lord. That there is something on the far horizon if we will open up our eyes to see. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are touching us. You are speaking. That we have, we have ears that we can actually hear from heaven. And know you and know your voice. We thank you, Lord. In your name, Jesus, we give you our hearts and we say, do unto us according to your word. Amen. Amen. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you. Be gracious unto you and give you peace until we meet again next week. Amen. Amen. Invite you all to prayer for prayer. Come on up. The, the pastors and the prayer team will be here.